And I'll send you the link. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Once again, thank you for attending tonight's District 6 community meeting. My name is Monica Leon, and I'm a public affairs specialist here at the Fremont Police Department. Tonight, our meeting is in currently in webinar format, and we will be utilizing the Q&A box and answering questions throughout the entire presentation. For all questions we do not answer, we will have a segment at the end of the presentation, and we will try to answer them there. Before we get started, I would like to ask Councilmember Cox if she would like to say a few words before handing it off to Chief Washington for the full presentation. Yes, good evening, everyone. I'm Teresa Cox, Fremont City Council member representing District 6, and as we affectionately call it, the Sensational Six. It is indeed my honor to uh, be here and help in supporting this community meeting. I look forward to working with everyone and please stay tuned for uh, upcoming National Night Out on August the 2nd, uh, where we had the Fremont Police collaborate and come to the neighborhoods. And it brings about our community together uh, to share uh, in the city where we live, work and play. If you have any questions, feel free to write to me at tcox at fremont.gov. Thank you so much uh, for uh, being able to host this tonight uh, with the Fremont Police and Police Chief uh, Sean Washington. Thank you so much, Monica, and your whole entire team. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Council Member Cox, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Washington. For those of you who do not know me, and I have the distinct honor and privilege to be the police chief here in this fine city of Fremont. Um, I'm excited about tonight to share some information on uh, where we are as far as public safety and crime and those type of things. And just to renew our commitment to being transparent and open about where we are. Uh, one thing that makes this uh, community so unique is the ability for us to engage and listen to our community's concerns and priorities. And so. Specifically, that's the reason for this meeting, working with your council member uh, specific to this district. We're going to talk about some, some um, uh, statistics that's specific to uh, this particular district that I think you will find uh, useful as well. So I really value the partnership that I have with your council member and how she has uh, uh, communicated with me over the uh, past couple of months about your priorities and what she's hearing out there in the community. Um, I'm also very grateful to have a very competent and wonderful staff that is uh, supporting me tonight, starting with Monica and, and Manager Canada and Amy G and Loveline from our IT department. And uh, we are very fortunate to have the opportunity to have our human services director here, Suzanne Shinfield, who has uh, uh, graced us with her presence to provide some information on Project Home Key, which I know has been of high interest to uh, several members of our community. So before I get into the, the police department's presentation, I'd like to turn it over to Suzanne to talk a little bit about uh, Project Home Key. So Suzanne. Great, thank you, Chief Washington. I wanted to uh, briefly touch on the city's application for funding to the state of California for $40 million to convert the Motel 6 on Research Avenue into 156 units of permanent affordable housing with supportive services on site. You know, addressing homelessness is one of the city council's highest priorities. And in the last couple of years, the city has opened a new housing navigation center um, in uh, a lot that's adjacent to City Hall. And we've also recently instituted a safe parking program uh, in partnership with our faith-based community for those living in non-recreational uh, vehicles. But neither of these programs provides really what homeless residents need, which is permanent affordable housing. 
that's really the biggest challenge we face in addressing homelessness, the lack of housing units that are affordable to people that are considered acutely low income, which means that they're trying to live in our community on 15% of median income and below. During COVID, the state developed a $1.5 billion home key program as a way to quickly and cost effectively move unsheltered people into permanent affordable housing through hotel conversions and other innovative approaches. HomeKey provides a really unique opportunity to secure state funding to address homelessness in Fremont. After reviewing proposals for four possible hotel conversion sites, staff recommended and council approved an application to the state to purchase and convert the Motel 6 site to affordable housing. Tenants will pay rent based on their income as do tenants in affordable housing units throughout the city. The city proposes to work with a developer which is called Shangri-La. They're from Southern California and they've had a lot of experience in both um, home key projects and in hotel conversions. Shangri-La partners with another agency which is called Step Up and they will be managing the property and they also will be providing supportive service on site for the residents who live there. Step Up has managed 15 similar projects across the country with great success and they have a very good track record of 97 percent retention which means that for tenants who have moved into Step Up housing um, even those who've been homeless for quite some time, 97% are still in housing after one year. The, <clears throat> this is a real opportunity to get people off of our streets and into a stable, permanent living situation. If the city's grant application is successful, and we should hear about that by the end of the month, the conversion of hotel rooms into studio apartments will need to be completed within one year. Um, once residents move in, Step Up will provide several on-site property managers to oversee the apartment complex and supportive service staff at a ratio of one to 25. So that means about six people on-site helping folks uh, with a variety of needs. The kinds of services that will be provided will include helping people with independent living skills and job training, food programs, transportation assistance, substance abuse and mental health treatment referrals, rep payee services, and community building through tenant activities and leadership development. A lot of people have ask the question about the requirement for the participants and the tenants in the housing to be employed. And I think we need to understand who makes up our uh, homeless population. Many of these folks are older adults. Many are um, living on disability income. So while they may wanna work full time physically, they may not be able to do that. Some will um, definitely get part-time jobs and others may choose to volunteer in the community and find other ways to give back. Um, the city has heard concerns from a number of residents regarding the potential for crime to increase if the home key application is successful. And I know Chief Washington, who's been a very good proponent of the project has some thoughts on that point. And I'm gonna turn this presentation back over to him now so uh, he can get on with the rest of his agenda. And I wanna say thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the home key effort. Thank you. Well, thank you, Suzanne. And yes, I, I, I would like to uh, just provide um, some comments from my perspective in projects such as this. Uh, I do believe that um, Projects like these uh, help 
with our public safety objectives. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the bulk of our calls for service uh, are related to those folks who do not have shelter, who are living on the streets and, uh, and um, for a variety of reasons. Um, our experience here in Fremont, and I know uh, several of my colleagues throughout the Bay Area, is that these type of projects generally do not produce additional or um, uh, calls for service for the police department. Any location will have some calls for service. So I'm not suggesting at all that there won't be any type of response to these type of facilities. However, in our experience and experience throughout the Bay Area, these uh, type of facilities do not um, support any additional calls. And it's important to distinguish a homeless shelter from a project that uh, like Suzanne uh, described as well. Um, as a city partner, we're gonna do our part if this does move forward to ensure that that particular area is addressed. So like we did with the Homeless Navigation Center uh, near City Hall, we monitor the area very carefully to ensure that it did not produce um, unintended uh, calls for service or criminal activity in that area. So that would be my commitment. Um, and I know we have a lot of competing interests throughout the the city to include uh, District 6, which is what we're here to talk about today. So um, I'd like to transition and move on and get into the rest of the presentation. But, you know, because of the city interest uh, in, in this project, uh, we invited um, uh, Director Shenfield to come and share uh, her perspective on this particular uh, initiative. So uh, next slide. First of all, again, I wanna welcome all of you to tonight uh, on the uh, participant list. I see some very familiar names. So uh, hello to all of you. And uh, I, was, I was just complimenting uh, Council Member Cox before the meeting got started on uh, one of my um, uh, uh, fondest memories of District 6 is when I had person to person or in-person interaction with many of the community members in District 6, and we uh, enjoyed ice cream, um, which was always a treat. So um, although I love and cherish all of the districts uh, throughout the city, uh, that uh, District 6 and uh, that interaction really sticks out to me. So I do appreciate uh, all It made it real sweet, though. Uh, <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> We're going to do and it I again. Look <laughs> yes. And I look forward to getting back to in-person interactions just as soon as we can, because I do think it's more productive. So we've, we've gone through the introductions. What I'm gonna do is briefly talk about the goals within my transition plan, uh, a crime update, and then we'll have time at the end to answer uh, any questions that you might have. So next slide. All right, so some of you may be familiar with the chief transitions plan and it is embedded in uh, our policing philosophy and very responsive to some of the feedback that we heard from our community uh, after the summer of 2020, when we had a series of engagement efforts and uh, meetings with our community. So uh, it's largely based on that. Uh, the first goal is to enhance community relationships, trust and police legitimacy. That is critically important right now with everything that's going on is that we have your trust and we are viewed as being legitimate by the community that we serve. Number two is to assess organizational effectiveness and efficiency. We don't have unlimited resources. So it's very important that we constantly assess how we deploy our resources and ensure that we're delivering the highest level of professional service to our community. Number three is to conduct uh, a comprehensive review of our policies and procedures. That is ongoing, that is underway right now, and I look forward to sharing uh, the results of that um, as we move forward. We also wanna provide better staffing, professional development, training and education to our staff. We understand that it's important to hire uh, the highest quality of individuals because that, what that does is it translates into uh, better service for our community. But we have to do that not only with hiring the right people, but developing those individuals, training and educating them uh, so that they can um, achieve our uh, service objectives. We also wanna increase internal communication, team building and employee wellness. Investing in employee wellness is critical. Once again, it's tied to our ability to deliver effective community service. And we wanna make sure we're building teams and 
ensuring that we're working together to deliver that service. And then also we want to make sure that we're being a good partner as one of several departments throughout the city in supporting initiatives like um, how to mitigate the impact of uh, our uh, unhoused population within our community. So we have a role in that, human services has a role in that and, and a, a plethora of other um, departments throughout the city. And we wanna be a, a good partner in that. So next slide. Uh, I should have mentioned that if you're not familiar with that transition plan, it is uh, online uh, and I will be uh, producing a 180 day uh, progress report to the city manager here shortly. So now let's get into the crime update. And it's important to understand that the data is from 2021 unless otherwise noted. Now I'll start by saying that I'm gonna talk about statistics and numbers. And I might even make some comparisons as far as something being high or low. I wanna be very clear that although I might be talking about numbers, I realize that these are people that have been impacted by these crimes. So if I make a comment that, hey, we, we reduced you know, robberies by, you know, we had 10 less robberies or something like that, it's not diminishing the impact that it's had on those individuals. So I wanted to make sure that's very clear because when I talk about these statistics, there are people behind each and every one of these numbers. So shooting incidents, my biggest concern right now, shooting incidents and firearm arrests, as you can see, from 2019 to 2020 to 2021, we've had an increase. And that's been uh, disturbing for me. So this has been a trend that Fremont has experienced, uh, but everyone in the region has experienced this trend. Uh, early in 2021, we realized that these numbers were starting to impact our community. And so shortly after, um, realizing that we developed the gun violence reduction team. And I think we've had some success in slowing the rate and the impact of these shooting incidents. Although we had an increase, I think that increase would have been uh, uh, more significant if we had not formed this team in direct response to providing service to our community. So we had 20 arrests and it's important to understand if we had not arrested those 20 individuals, those could have been more shooting incidents and more firearms that were out uh, impacting our community. So our goal is to investigate and reduce shootings and gun crimes, but we focus on quick apprehension to prevent additional incidents. And that's been our focus and that's gonna remain our focus until we can get um, uh, those numbers headed in the right direction and trending downward. Uh, so this is a priority for our um, uh, department. It will continue to be a priority for our department um, as we move forward. So next slide. All right. Homicide and serious assaults. Uh, this again is where I'm going to have some comparisons with our numbers. But again, we have three individuals last year that lost their lives. So I want those numbers to be zero. Uh, but we've remained uh, pretty steady as far as our homicide rate um, comparatively speaking, for the size of our city, this is still a very safe city as it, re, uh, as, as, as it relates to homicides. So although I want it to be zero, three is still um, you know, within our averages over the last uh, few years, as you can see. The three homicides that we did have, each were resolved by arrest, meaning we solved each of those homicides so we don't have any outstanding or unsolved homicides within the city. Um, serious assaults and attempted homicide, as you can see, that trend is not going in the right direction. Um, we did have an increase from 2020 to 2021, and uh, we're trying to figure out uh, what is causing this spike. And uh, there's a lot of people smarter than me that are out there studying it because it has impacted our entire nation. We are seeing more serious assaults and attempted homicides and Fremont, uh, unfortunately, has not been exempt from that trend. Uh, next slide. So robberies, uh, some good news with our robberies. We have been trending down. We stayed steady from 2020 to 2021. But as you can see, from 2017 to 18, we have had a trend in the downward um, trajectory. Uh, the key again here is quick response. 
uh, thorough investigation and sub subsequent apprehension. If you're not familiar with our organization, we pride ourselves on ensuring that we will follow up and apprehend anyone, whether they're in Fremont or outside of Fremont, wherever they're located, if they committed a crime here in Fremont, we will send resources to wherever they are and try to bring them to justice. That's a reputation that we have, the criminals know that, and other law enforcement agencies throughout the uh, region respect that as well. So that will continue. Uh, we also collaborate with our outside agencies to share regional uh, suspect information. That's important because we know that a lot of our suspects are coming from outside of Fremont to cause harm and commit crime. So it's important that we have that relationship with our allied agencies to ensure that we can identify these uh, folks who are impacting our communities. Uh, next slide. All right, burglary. So uh, we'll start with residential. Uh, residential burglaries have trended down uh, thanks to the efforts of our um, uh, crime intelligence unit, as well as our patrol officers and a whole host of other folks. Most importantly, I think that our residential burglary rate has continued to trend down because of all of you, our community, our community who has invested in cooperating with the police department, investing in cameras and tools that we need to follow up and bring these individuals to justice. That's very important. So that trend has continued and, uh, and we're very happy about that. Commercial burglaries, as you can see in 2020, there was a big spike in commercial burglaries at our businesses. And then it started to trend down in 2021. We're doing a little bit of analysis. We believe that that was a result of COVID. So COVID, when things shut down and, and a lot of people stayed at home and businesses were being left unoccupied, we think that provided a window of opportunity for uh, criminals to take full advantage of that. As we started to come out of COVID in 2021, people started going back to work. We think that's why those, uh, that it started to trend downward again, because we had more people in the workplace, so the opportunity wasn't there. Again, that's just our assessment uh, of, of wh where we are. So I'm hoping that that's accurate because as we get back into 2022 and more people go back to work, I hope that our numbers will go down even further uh, for commercial burglaries. Uh, vehicle burglaries, uh, again, that's trending down in the right direction. You could see that from 2020 to 2021, uh, it's trending down. So again, a crime of opportunity, a lot of folks weren't out and about uh, getting their cars burglarized at shopping centers as shopping centers were um, closed down. We think those vehicles were uh, more often parked in folks' driveways or in their garages, and that could have contributed to the downward trend, but we'll take it and we hopefully that it continues. Uh, high visibility patrols have been utilized as a deterrent for a long time. We believe that that is a really effective way um, to help deter uh, these type of crimes. We focus on repeat offenders. We know that a small minority of our population is responsible for the majority of our crime. So we try to identify those folks and uh, apprehend them to make a difference. And then like I talked about before, use of technology and resources is critical to our success as a city to keep our crime rate um, as low as it is. So. Uh, I think our community as a whole is very supportive of our use of technology, and I'm hoping that that continues um, as we move forward. Next slide. All right, so auto theft. Uh, here is something that um, I'm not happy about. Uh, the trend is going upward. Um, many repeat offenders. Uh, the focus, again, is on utilizing technology, automatic license plate readers to identify these cars as they drive through our community. So if your car gets stolen, we have the technology to identify um, if it passes one of our cameras, uh, where that car is and help uh, locate it in or recover the car and apprehend the suspect. So with auto theft, um, once again, um, we're monitoring uh, the impact that this has. We believe that some of the um, limitations that were placed on our ability to hold some of these individuals in custody may be a contributing factor. So due to COVID, um, certain types of felonies, and auto theft is a felony, 
um, we were not able to hold these individuals in custody, meaning if we arrested, stopped someone that had stolen your car, arrested that person, we were not able to take them into physical custody. We had to issue them a notice to appear and release them on a citation. Uh, the criminals are smart. Well, they're not smart because they're criminals, but you get my point that they figured out that uh, there was very little uh, initial accountability for these type of crimes. So we think that we had a lot of repeat offenders that um, felt like uh, they had free range to commit these crimes and uh, we had limited uh, response to um, follow up with it. So uh, anyway, hopefully uh, we're coming out of COVID and that will be reversed and we can uh, go back to having uh, some more accountability. Next slide. All right, so grand theft. Uh, you can see a huge spike there. Uh, grand theft, we think uh, the majority of that spike is linked to the increase um, catalytic converter thefts. And I think you all are familiar with those thefts, uh, taking that device off of a car and selling it for the uh, metals inside is very lucrative. There is legislation that's being pro proposed to try to um, uh, mitigate the impact of these crimes by you know, requiring certain type of identification or you, know, you have to show proof of where you got the device from or you can't pay in cash and all those things at the legislative level are being considered. So hopefully we can mitigate that and again, this is not a Fremont issue. This is a regional and national issue that uh, is going to require some legislative uh, support there. We do investigate uh, in, in, uh, focus on secondhand dealers and recyclers. Uh, and then again, regional information sharing is the key. Next slide. Sideshow activity. Um, I'm not, I, I don't think sideshow activity impacts uh, District 6 that often, but um, I know in the north end of town in uh, District 1, it's definitely an issue. In fact, uh, I think last Friday, we had a pretty significant sideshow. You probably heard about the sideshow that was in Oakland, and unfortunately, someone uh, lost their life up in Oakland. Um, that was our sideshow. So it's very mobile. Uh, the folks that were in Oakland traveled down to Fremont and landed in Fremont and then uh, we had to go and respond. So it was, that was the exact same sideshow that you saw in Oakland uh, travel um, to Fremont and they do that. So I'm sure after they left Fremont, they probably continued on to San Jose and then they'll land there, they'll do what they have to do and then they'll continue on. And so that's the inherent challenge in addressing uh, this activity because it is very spontaneous and mobile in nature. However, in 2020, we did see a, a, a increase, and then we, we devised some strategies that we think helped to uh, mitigate uh, the number of incidents that came to our city. Traffic and patrol teams deployed to key hotspots hot during peak hours of activity, and that was based on analysis. So we proactively put officers in some of these areas um, that we felt uh, either we had intelligence or information that this might develop, or uh, we just analyzed the dates and times that these, or uh, the days of the weeks and times that this activity occurred, and we proactively tried to uh, deter folks from uh, going to those areas. The focus on regional information sharing to deter high profile events like this uh, is critical. Uh, one of the things that we have to refresh and why. Um, we weren't able to proactively predict the last sideshow that occurred last weekend was that there was a breakdown in communication from uh, some of the cities in the northern part of the county and that information didn't trickle down to Fremont in time. So we were behind, we were catching up. The sideshow had already developed before we were able to react. So we're, we're, we're fixing that for sure. Uh, next slide. All right, homeless and disturbance disturbance calls for service. And what we call 5150 reports, and these are reports that uh, we are able to detain someone that is suffering from some sort of uh, uh, mental health uh, emergency or issue. So that's what a 5150 uh, is. Homeless disturbance calls, um, as you can see, we, uh, we, are, we are trending down, kind of holding steady. 
we have approximately nine homeless related disturbance calls per day. Uh, and that was taken from 20 to 21 uh, data. You might notice in 2018, it seems very low and we had a spike. Well, that's kind of misleading because in 2018 is when we started to collect this data. So we don't have a full year's worth of data. We started collecting it in 2018. So I would imagine that our homeless disturbance calls for service, if we were able to measure it in that year, would be consistent with the numbers that you see in the uh, subsequent years. Now with uh, 5150 reports, you can see that trend has gone down. I do, I do attribute uh, that downward spike to the work of our MET unit, which is our mobile evaluation unit. We've increased uh, that unit, uh, uh, not with officers, but by clinicians. So if you're not familiar with that unit, these are, uh, this is a team of specially trained police officers that uh, have the ability to uh, follow up and engage with those that are suffering from uh, mental illness episodes. And then we partner them with the clinician or mental health professional that then can do follow up and provide um, support services for these individuals. And we started to see some success in that. And we believe that that team really has made an impact on the number of calls for service uh, regarding that population. Next slide. All right, so we'll get into uh, hate crimes just a little bit. So before I talk about the statistics here, it's important for me to describe what a hate crime is versus a hate incident. And if you're familiar with the difference, I, I apologize in advance, but I know that I get this question quite often from uh, community members to explain the difference. So a hate crime is a crime against a person or a group or property motivated by the victim's real or perceived protected social um, group, like a disability, gender, nationality, those type of things. And uh, the crime was motivated um, by that protected status. Uh, we understand hate crimes are serious, uh, may result in imprisonment or jail. Now, so those are the crimes. Those are the crimes that you will see that we are reporting. However, a hate incident stops short of being a crime. However, it's important for me to understand, uh, for you to understand that the uh, significance of a hate incident is still there. It's still very impactful. Uh, in fact, I myself uh, experienced a hate incident about a month ago on one of these calls where, um, you know, hateful words were directed towards me uh, as the chief. Uh, and so you can just use your imagination. I won't dignify um, that particular individual by repeating the words that they use. But a hate incident still has that impact, right? But it's an action or a behavior motivated by hate, but which for one or more reasons does not qualify as a crime. So name call. If you call someone a, a very um, inappropriate, uh, hate motivated name, it's not a crime. Um, displaying hate material on your own property technically is protected speech and it's not a crime. Uh, posting hate material that does not result in property damage, same thing. And uh, distribution of materials with hate uh, message in public areas. Again, none of these things rise to the level of a crime, but uh, the impact is still significant and we take them very serious. So from 2020 to 2021, we did have uh, go from four to seven uh, hate crimes reported in our city again. Um, those numbers are relatively uh, low compared to the population that we have, but very significant again. Of those incidents, we had three which were anti-religion and, and four that were anti-race. And so these are the incidents that we report to DOJ that qualify as a hate crime. Next slide. Okay, right now uh, we wanna get into some district specific data that we are very, I am very fortunate to have manager candidate here to kind of take us through this as her unit is responsible for producing these numbers and what better person to kind of explain uh, the uh, statistics and how we got here than uh, manager candidate. So I'll turn it over to you, Joanna. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, good evening, everyone. What you see on this uh, screen here is uh, some crime stat comparisons that I will explain in a moment. 
And in the middle is a typical crime analysis heat map. I don't want you to be too alarmed that all of that red is a lot of crime. It's actually reporting. So um, there are many types of police reports, uh, non-criminal, such as miscellaneous public service, found property, suspicious circumstances, um, 5150s, uh, traffic accidents, et cetera. And then of course, crime is included in these. But very interestingly, your district does not have a lot of hot spots for crime. Uh, a number of other districts do, those that have major retail centers such as uh, the Hub or Pacific Commons, um, some, other, some other areas, particularly commercial areas that draw crime. Uh, but uh, your primary hotspot for activity is probably the Five Corners area of Safeway. But again, it usually is commercial areas and the crime is typically property crime. Uh, just to explain hot spots, um, if you don't infer, uh, it's a small geographic area where crime is committed and it happens frequently enough that it's predictable. So we spend a lot of um, focus on these hot spots, deploying officers uh, for crime prevention, uh, and disruption, we're hoping their presence deters the crime. And so again, uh, they do, they spend a lot of their proactive unallocated time in the hotspots in the city that are all pre-designated and defined by analysis. Uh, so to jump into the crime types, comparing again, last year's data to the year prior, there were zero homicides, uh, your robbery decreased, that robbery stat includes um, 11 robberies, which could be armed or unarmed, such as forcing your iPhone from you in a parking lot, uh, or a robbery with a gun. Uh, two Estes robberies, which essentially are shoplifting, where they use force, pushing you know, the security guard out of the way, two carjackings, and one home invasion uh, crime. In, in your robbery category. For residential burglary, uh, you can see that there was a decrease of 38%. That includes 20, 23, sorry, 23 residential burglaries and 13 burglaries from garages. So that's a total of 36. Uh, your commercial burglary has also seen a nice decrease. Um, in addition to the chief's commentary on COVID, uh, we really at the beginning of last year uh, deployed a number of strategies and efforts with our patrol teams in you know, spending time in those areas and focusing on offenders that we knew had been um, prolific. And so I think that has also attributed to a decrease, which is nice to see the effectiveness of that. And then also a decrease in auto burglary to 139. Um, auto theft, a significant increase. And as the chief said, we, you know, we have seen this citywide and uh, throughout the region. Brand theft, another increase from 126 to 170. Um, of those, uh, as the chief said, catalytic converter is a, has been a huge factor. Um, and of your 170 in the district, 115 of those were catalytic converter thefts. This trend, you know, which emerged during COVID due to the resale of the metals that are extracted from the converters. And then petty and mail theft. This is a combination of several um, theft, uh, misdemeanor theft crimes. Uh, while there is a slight increase, um, your petty theft actually decreased, but you, there was a significant increase in mail theft. That was another citywide trend we saw during COVID. Uh, I, we believe that uh, you know, people were encouraged um, or tempted to steal mail, seeking uh, benefit cards, uh, payments from the government, uh, checks, personal identifying information to commit ID theft. So it was, it was a substantial, it has been a substantial problem. Uh, let's see, vandalism, a slight increase, and then reports, just a, a minor increase. Um, again, those are all police reports in, in your district, including traffic accidents, crime, and miscellaneous um, events. Uh, 
Calls for service. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to define this for you. Um, these are documents, I'm sorry, documented incidents generated from 911 and non-emergency calls, as well as officer self-initiated activity. So these are calls from the community for help or service, and then also um, officers basically, uh, you know, patrolling, uh, doing focused outreach, et cetera. So not all calls for service are dispatched for a police response. Some callers are referred to our online reporting system, while others are other issues or concerns are determined to be non-criminal matters requiring no police response at all. These would include uh, private tows, wireless 911 disconnects, there are quite a few of those that really elevate uh, these calls for service totals. And then 415H, uh, as the chief explained, these are homeless disturbance calls. You had an increase of 11% in your district. And then proactive calls for service. Um, this is an astounding increase that I haven't seen in any other districts. Um, and this is a great thing. This is actually a combination of three different call types. Um, Intelligence-led policing, which is our, our abbreviation for efforts by our patrol teams um, in areas identified by analysis that have had uh, crime issues and they are spending time there to to prevent or deter those crimes from occurring. It also includes TSAT, which is short for traffic saturation, and that is often generated by requests and complaints from community members. TSAT is often conducted in, uh, in and around our schools. Um, you know, the officers uh, conduct enforcement or provide warnings or are just present uh, in trying to encourage better driving behavior to keep our kids safe. But they also uh, use analysis again for uh, traffic collision areas and, and spend, uh, they saturate those areas at peak uh, times, usually commute uh, morning and evening hours. And then the last call type is what we call 1059, which is security checks. And essentially, you know, we have community members call in saying their, their home is being fumigated, it's tented, they're worried it'll be broken into. And so that information is communicated to patrol teams and they would conduct a 1059. Uh, those are just basically being on the lookout for, for smaller problems and concerns. But again, that, um, that is a, a great increase to see that activity. And, and then just briefly to the right, top 10 reports. Uh, these are reports, not necessarily crimes. So as you can see, the first four are crimes. The numbers may not correspond exactly to the left because we grouped several crime types together for some of those crimes. Uh, but ultimately you can see here, these were the 10 most um, highest volume of reports for your district, which just indicates some additional activity in your, in your area. Chief, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Joanna. Um, next slide. Okay, now I know that this is a big um, topic, not only for this district, but also our entire city. And I, I even see that there's a question in the chat about, um, you know, what are we doing, um, you, you know, with uh, homeless encampments uh, along Washington. So uh, actually, I can just respond to that right now. Actually, uh, a, a month ago, I went and visited on a Saturday morning, uh, that particular area. I, I, I went out, I was in plain clothes, uh, I went with another uh, um, uh, officer and there was a group out there that was helping to uh, provide support uh, for the individuals in that area. I, and I did that because I wanted to get my, my, my eyes on the issues out there. And I will tell you that um, that particular area uh, is being talked about. And as you can imagine with 90 square miles, almost 90 square miles, square miles and competing interests, we're trying to prioritize the areas based on calls for service and crime and all those other sorts of things that may be associated with it. So I, I, I will tell you that it is being talked about. And you know, if we can get resources into that area, um, we will. And uh, I had a conversation with the, 
the uh, the folks who were living in that area, and I told them that uh, as a police chief, uh, if there is crime, if there are other impacts to the community that uh, starts to uh, have a, uh, a a negative impact, then um, that will um, spark or initiate the need for us to go in and remove that particular uh, uh, encampment. And so uh, it is a balance because when we remove the encampment, uh, they're gonna find another place to, to live. That's why housing is so important because we can um, remove them from a particular area, we can arrest them, but at the end of the day, if they still don't have shelter and they're still homeless, they're just gonna be another neighborhood's issue uh, down the street. So, um, you know, the strat that's why I'm so supportive of the strategies that um, human services and others are uh, trying to get uh, moving here. So, uh, homeless related costs. So, citywide, uh, 3,208. Uh, your district had 452. That accounts for 14% of the total calls throughout the city. Uh, you did have a, uh, it did go up uh, 11 or 11%. Uh, from 2020, so you did see an increase in the homeless-related calls by about 11% from 2020 to 2021. Uh, our MET team that we talked about a little bit ago, uh, uh, they're a specialized collaborative team providing outreach and bridging services for homeless uh, and those in mental health crisis. And we talked about the clinician and coordination with human services. Now, recently, to increase our capacity, I directed members of our street crimes unit to go out and be supportive of the MET unit when we do have to remove an encampment or we have individuals within that encampment that we know are responsible for crimes in our community. We utilize our street crimes unit now to go and help follow up with those crimes and try to mitigate the impact. Uh, next slide. So here's just some information on how to stay connected with us. I'm sure uh, most of you know how um, to do that, but uh, we wanted to provide that uh, in case you didn't. And then I think the next slide is where we will open it up for any questions. I see we have a few in the chat. And then uh, after we answer those questions, we'll definitely uh, give the council member an opportunity um, to ask any additional questions. So Monica, back to you. All right, here's the first question. Do we have stats from Irvington High School as well, since we have an officer permanently stationed there? Hold on one moment, I gotta click over. Ir and they mean Irvington stats such as admonishments, referrals, arrests, 5150s, racial makeup, makeup of the LGBTQ plus students year over year. Yes, so uh, we do not have the statistics currently for some of that. Some of that data we do have, like the number of admonishments, citations and those type of things. But, um, you know, stats on, you know, how someone identifies or the race makeup. In January 2022, uh, we were required to start collecting that data. And it's perceived, right? It's, it's what the officer's perception is because we cannot, by law, ask someone, um, you know, their, 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 their gender, their race, uh, how they identify. We can't do that. So it's our perception. Which, if you think about it, the data is going to likely not be accurate, but at least it's a starting point uh, for us to report that data out. So we hope to have at least six months of that data at the end of the school year. Um, our commitment to the school district is to collect that data and produce a comprehensive report so that uh, all of you uh, in the community knows how the SROs are um, providing service in uh, that particular school. and um, and uh, those statistics that you mentioned. So uh, more to come, that report will be made publicly available um, at the end of the school year. Okay, this next one is a series of three questions. So I'll just say one and then I'll let you answer and then go through the other two. Can you explain what constitutes a hate crime? Yeah, so like I said, it's, any, it's anything that's motivated, it has to be a crime for one. And if, that, if the crime was motivated by someone's protected class, um, that's what gets it into the category of a hate crime. So if you, uh, I don't know, if you 
if you vandalized uh, someone's property because of their protected class, uh, as a result of that, um, and motivated by that, that would be a hate crime. Um, so that that would that hopefully that explains the difference between a hate crime and a hate incident in which, if it's uh, if it's just protected speech or something like that, then it, it, it's really not a crime. Okay. With the number of citizens who own firearms, is there a way FPD can institute a PSA educating gun owners on how to legal use a firearm? Yeah, not a bad idea. Uh, maybe we can put something together utilizing our community engagement uh, unit to put something out if that's a concern. Uh, for sure, anything we can do to mitigate uh, the impacts that um, irresponsible or illegal firearms uh, pose to our community. I'm receptive to that feedback and any ideas. Okay, can the city look at installing cameras in the neighborhood starting with the high crime areas? Yeah, so, so this is interesting. So we, we encourage the use of cameras for sure. And so if the neighborhood got together and they wanted to install cameras, please reach out to us because um, there could be a partnership there. But oftentimes, you know, some neighborhoods uh, the neighborhood itself will pay for the cameras, uh, or rinks, and they just they just coordinate with us for the installation of the cameras, right? So we don't have the ability to install cameras in every neighborhood, but if a community group gets together and they want to pull and, co and, and coordinate with the police department, we welcome that. We believe in that technology as a great mitigation tool to uh, crime, and we want to advertise that to any would-be criminals that uh, if you're gonna come into Fremont and cause harm, we're watching you and our neighbors are watching you. So uh, anyway, um, we can provide more information to you on that if, uh, if your particular neighborhood is interested. Chief, how about the homeless persons too, like in, who have been tent living at the corner of Fremont Boulevard and Delaware Drive? Well, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that particular, um, those, those particular individuals. But what I can uh, say is that we will note those individuals. I'll try to get some background and research to see what we have done. Oftentimes, uh, it won't, they won't be like a, a mystery to us that maybe we've gone out before on those individuals and offered services and those type of things. So I would have to get more background uh, to really describe what limitations, if any, we have on trying to help that particular situation. Okay, where can I find crime stats for District 3? Um, is District 3 coming up? Did we already do District 3? Or that's yes. coming up? Uh, we already did. Okay, yeah, so we should have that, um, that information that we can get to District 3. We've done this presentation for every district and we customized it to uh, each particular district as well. So we do have that information and, and if Monica can make note, we can, we can direct you to where that is. Definitely. Um, one more question in the queue, and then I know uh, council member ha also had her hand raised. Uh, will something be done with the growing camp on Driscoll in Washington near Safeway? Oh, yeah. So that's the one that um, that I went out to and I uh, visited personally. I think it's important for me to not only hear the perspectives from our community, but actually get my own eyes on it. Right. So. Uh, that one I know is on our radar to try to address. Again, uh, it does have a lot to do with uh, our ability to have and devote resources to that area. So more to come on that. I know that's not probably the answer you want, but it's the honest answer on us uh, making a fair assessment of that particular area and being responsive to the concerns that you've brought up. Council Member Cox. Oh, you're muted. Oh, sorry, you're muted. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I understand that the city of Milpitas is implementing a program called Get Etched with their catalytic converters. And I was wondering, is that something that um, our police department is looking into? Yes, in fact, uh, well, uh, very timely. Uh, my um, captain that oversees the special operations division just informed me about that particular program and he's looking into seeing if we want to partner with some of our businesses to do just that you know it, it won't eliminate the issue but uh it's something right it, it's another 
uh, way to try to mitigate the impact here of that, of that particular uh, crime. So yes, um, we are looking into that. Oh, that's great. That's great uh, to hear. I also, um, I know I was leading to, I think it was Mr. Um, Welch had mentioned about, uh, was it firearms? Whoever the, the community resident was at, uh, okay. And I, I thought it would be quite timely. Um, I know that there's some other things uh, happening with our assembly bill 481 um, that talks about um, disclosure of um, the, uh, the police equipment mm -hmm. and is there, would you like to share a little bit because there's some people that are asking about that. Sure. That I've gotten yeah. calls about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that uh, question. So Assembly Bill 481 basically went into law in January of this year. Essentially what it says is that the police department, all police departments in the state of California has to declare and identify all military equipment and have that approved by um, our city council. So continued use if we already have that equipment or if we wanna purchase any new equipment, we have to have uh, city council's approval. The law also requires that we uh, note and log all of the equipment that we have, document how and when we use it and the number of times that we use it and uh, produce a report and have a community engagement session with our community and allow them to ask any questions or um, file any complaints or concerns about the use of this equipment. Now, the law is very specific and it defines military equipment. However, uh, it's very important for our community to understand that we don't have any, any surplus military equipment at the police department. There is a program out there that's called the 1033 program that actually allows law enforcement agencies to, uh, for free of charge, to acquire military equipment, true military equipment from the military and use it as uh, tools for the police department. We don't have any of that. We have very uh, police specific and designed equipment that we utilize to help protect our, our community. The other thing is uh, something like uh, drones that you can buy at the, uh, a local store um, that any of you can go out and buy, we can buy the same exact piece of equipment. And because it's utilized by the government or a police department, it's considered military equipment, even though it's the same exact piece of equipment. Our, our, our mobile command vehicle, some of you have seen that, that huge mobile command vehicle that we have that we share with the fire department, uh, that's considered military equipment as well. So although we have to comply with the law and, and declare these items, um, we use these things in a responsible way and they're not truly military pieces of equipment, meaning we don't get any surplus equipment from the military. So in a nutshell, that's the law and that's how we're gonna comply with it. Thank you so much. So there were a few questions that were left in the chat. I went ahead and gave them my email address to go ahead and uh, email me directly and I will follow up again after this meeting. Chief and council member, if there's anything you would like to close up with this meeting, but thank you everybody for attending. I would yeah, like I'll just turn it, I'll just turn it back okay. over to the council member Cox, but I just wanted to thank all of you again for your time. I think this is very important as a new chief. It's important for me to hear your perspectives, your concerns, your priorities, and it helps me develop plans uh, on how to help um, address those concerns and priorities. So I just really cherish the opportunity. I know Councilmember Cox and I talk quite often, and so she does represent you very well, and I, I do um, value that relationship because it allows me to continue to serve uh, this great community. So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to the next time we can get together in person and uh, share some ice cream. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, Fremont Police Chief uh, Sean uh, Washington. Um, I really appreciate you and your staff and, and all of our police officers because it's part of the important partnership of being neighbors and working together in our community. And I know that some things, you know, we may not like to see an increase and like to see a decrease, 
but there's opportunity for us to help improve in those areas and work together. And I can't think enough um, with the program that you have that's about National Night Out. And that really brings out the neighbors, brings out everyone to talk about crime, talk about starting um, these type of groups, because I think with COVID, it helped us to bring people together um, while we were locked inside our houses, but also to connect with another another and be brotherly and sisterly love that we can watch out for each other. So I continue um, to support the National Night Out. Um, we'll continue to support um, the initiatives that the Fremont Police are, are working on, but also to uh, be able to be a better city council member to work with issues that we do have and things that we can work together and bring people together um, and helping to solve um, this because it, it's it's besides the police, it takes all of us as good neighbors to watch out for each other. So I, I really wanna thank very much um, the entire staff, the entire police department and also um, our uh, human services director, um, Susan Shinfield, and also all of you that are took the time to come and, and listen to this important presentation um, because this is a start of many things that I look forward to all of us working together for our community. And that's how we build a better community by working together. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night and we'll see you soon.